All right, folks, we're going to kind of change pace a little bit today, and I'd like to share with you a little something that's kind of important for all of us. And uh, I have a small platform, so I'm going to go ahead and use it. Anyway, we all know that climate change is an item. All right, we live in California. We have drought, and we have fires. Okay? Both problems are a big problem for this state. And every single state in the Union has equally as bad problems. I just happen to know a little bit more about California because I'm living here. But what I want to show you is an example that was taught to me by Stan Parsons in uh, a school I went to several times. And it's a new concept. It's called Ranching for Profit. But anyway, Stan was a real good guy. He was straight up. And he did not mix words. And then the other mentor to me was Will Rogers from the great state of Oklahoma. Will was the original Captain Obvious. He just looked around and then he talked about what he saw and that's how, that's how he made a living. It was pretty amazing. But anyway, if you'll excuse me one second, I'll be right back. I, gotta, I want to explain about the rancher environmentalist, how we can get along. Okay, now as an environmentalist slash rancher, I'm going to show you what herd effect is. This represents the cl cloven hoof of an animal. Goat, sheep, and cow. Of course, i got to be able to see it. Okay, this half I'm going to put the cloven hoof in. That's from animals walking on the ground. This ground represents burnt ground after one of our horrendous fires that puts everybody out of their homes. So now the fire season's over and the rain comes. So the rain falls and the water runs down the Sierra Nevada and all the other hills we have and you'll see which water got to the bottom and has the most water in it. Now the point of this little observation is, is A, every time you have a divot in the ground it, it works as a reservoir, a place to catch water. Now if you multiply this catching water and going back into the groundwater by several million you'll have what's known as the herd effect. Then that means you're grazing goats, sheep, or cattle on ground. Now if you come in right after a fire, the ground is hard and baked like a moonscape. The water runs right straight off. And then the people down in Santa Barbara lose them fancy homes. And you know I can already hear the rumblings but it doesn't matter to me. The point is I know for a fact that if we were to graze California and suppress fire, our fires wouldn't be so bad. The other reason our fires are so bad is because there's millions and millions of dead standing trees in our forests. They don't need to be there. Okay, everybody whined about logging. Well now, grazing has to come back with herders, incidentally. If you look up herder in the dictionary, it'll say philosopher. That's what they turn into. It's also what cowboys do. And if you look at logging, what you need is a bunch of fallers, which to me were the spade bit of the logging industry. And then all these kids that are making video games and inventing games put their brain to work inventing a way to get them logs out without tearing up the country. It can be done. But I'm telling you now, since I'm a coffin cheater, is that if we were to graze the land it will improve the land and it will suppress the heat of the fires and help with erosion. Now the water table raises and we catch water because of going downhill. We've got a mountain range runs all the way up the middle of our state and several other ranges. You put water back in the groundwater and as soon as you get outside of every national park in California you put in a dam. That cloven hoof print is a dam. 
a dam can be as big as a thousand acres. And then you make all the water that comes out of the mountains, snow melt, walk, and not run. Well, every spring it happens that they have to let out a bunch of water and it goes right into the ocean. Well, if I'm not mistaken, the oceans are rising. So why add to the problem? Catch the water and put it in the ground. You got Sacramento and San Francisco. There's just a few people there. And I'll quit babbling, but the gist of my story is, is that the one thing that the environmentalists haven't penciled in is people. Every year there's more people. So if you've got an industry of goats, sheep, and cattle, which will suppress grass and fires, and oh, by the way, provide a whole lot of food for a lot of people, oh, and by the way, it'll raise the groundwater, then they're going to have to find something else to get grants for. And I will guarantee you, every rancher along the slope, east slope or west slope, east slope, to L.A. took all their water. Well, all the ranchers that I know, they're not poor. And they would not have a problem making a commitment to, to put in dams on their privately owned property and slow that water down. Well, they have to be freed up to do that. Make water walk, do not let water run, and all of us will win. Thank you so much. Okay, folks, uh, I'm, I'm going to go back over something because there's a lot of people that wanted me to, so I will. hate to be redundant, but that's the way it is. The stop and the backup are intertwined when you teach them. And to back a horse up, I tighten the muscles right here. They're called the quads if you want to get high tech. And if you watch my foot when I tighten it, it just raises up my knee. Well, on the inside of my leg, it's taking the pressure off of my horse. So I do that with both legs. And the reason I teach a horse to back up that way is because if he falls into sin, I'm able to move my leg and it means something. If I have both my spurs on him all the time, it's hard to keep him straight. That's, that's one of the reasons. And then when I teach the stop, I, I do the same thing with my legs. When I sit down and exhale, I take my legs off. And that way he understands all the pressures off. Because remember, the whole premise of what everything I've been sharing with you is uh, release. And uh, speaking of that, we're going to, we'll be in Midland, Texas in May. We're heading our way back to Georgia. And our friend Reed, he's putting on a clinic going and one coming back. So if you want to get in a clinic with us, that's where we'll be if that helps out to your country. And it's a three-day deal, and he can give you the particulars, how it works and everything, but uh, we'd love to see you. They're, they're kind of fun, at least for me. But uh, there you go. Now, I sit up, I tighten the muscles in my leg, and I ask my horse to walk backwards. As soon as it starts to move, I give the rein. So now I'm going to use my feet to wake my horse up and say, I really need you to make real steps. I keep giving the rein until the horse walks backwards on a loose rein. That's how I start this process. When I want to stop, I just sit down, exhale, and take my legs off my horse. Then when I sit up, it means something. And when I tighten those muscles, it means something. And remember, all of this has to do with a safe ride without pulling on their mouth. So I'm just kind of bumping him into collection. I'm getting ready to stop, and I build on it to where it's walk, trot, lope, and the horse understands it. Okay, I've been riding this horse in this bit for a while, and then I moved on over to the half-breed, which you've seen. And I'm going to put the half-breed on and show you where I'm at. So when do you move on? Well, you move on when you can do this one-handed... And your horse understands to walk backwards on his own accord. In other words, he's intentionally walking backwards. Which means he's listening to my legs in my seat. The bit is so you can ride one-handed, have more control of your horse. And with the weight of the bit and the angle of the cheek piece, because I'm, I'm now pulling off the corner of the mouth 
Next, I'll be pulling off the pressure of the curb strap, and you'll see the difference. That's what brings this horse into full collection. He's, going, he's still out a little bit. Well, that'll change over time with the bit. So I'll get the bit and show you what I mean. Okay, folks, now I'd just like to have you watch Bugs' head. And I've, I've taken the weight off, sit up straight, bend back about a half an inch, not a foot, and I asked the horse to walk backwards. Now, he knows how to walk backwards. The uh, nose bend now is hardly, it's it just there. I'm getting rid of it. It's just real close to getting rid of that. If he runs into my hand like he threw his head, that's his fault. It's not mine. Now he's figuring out to get where he needs to be. My legs will wake him up and say, okay, I need you to walk backwards. And ask him. As I mentioned it before, but when I sort cattle, a lot of times I do it walking backwards down an alley. It helps draw the cattle to me. And it makes it easier to, to sort them because they're not all wadding up in the back of the alley. So having a good backup on a ranch horse is pretty essential. So over time, with the weight of this bit, he, he, he naturally bridles up pretty nice. But it's going to get really nice later on. Now the stop, and this bit, you've seen the mouthpiece. It's just a, it's a San Joaquin mouthpiece. And uh, there's nothing severe about it. It's just a piece of steel in there. And what my point is, is that if you have a horse that wants to dance or act stupid and people tell us about him running away, well, if you, if you use the sentence, the horse ran away, by the time you say ran away, you were late. You were really late. So don't be afraid to shut a horse down. You can shut him down with a bit like this. Don't be afraid to do that. You just don't do it every time. Let him know that, there is a spot there where you've got to, you've got to respect this. Well, that's just part of the riding process. Now, I'm going to sit down and stop the horse. So that's just me setting down. The faster a horse goes, the shorter your range should be because they do actually get collection. Now that's just me exhaling, taking my legs off and sitting down. Now I do pull, but I pull about the weight of an apple. I'm not having to rip his head off. Now if he started getting dancy and all bothered, I would, I would put some force behind this and shut him down and probably back him up and then hand him the rein. So if you do ever get after a horse and you got to let him know you mean it, don't hang on him. Then it gets the other way. Bust him, get out. Leave them alone. If they do it again, bust them, back them up, and pitch them the rain. And you'll find out that you can get through this a lot easier than hanging on the rain. Most people hang on the rain because they're scared. All the everything you've ever seen me do is for nothing if that's the way you're riding. We already talked about fear. So Bugs here, he's He's got a pretty nice work ethic, real nice work ethic. And uh, what I wanted to talk about, about the, the grazing I was telling you about, it's called the herd effect, is that if you would, please just open up your mind and think about it. And every single state has gravity somewhere. And gravity is what draws water down to get to the Missouri, to get to the Mississippi, to get to the Bighorn River. We got the Sierra Nevadas. East side, west side, two completely different worlds. But the fact is that water was given to us in this state in the form of snow and it needs to be preserved now because no matter how radical environmentalist you are or how radical rancher you are, every day there's more people, period. So we need to be thinking ahead and get ready for it. And I guarantee you, we can graze all these hills everywhere around us. 
and save a whole lot of families, lives, everything. It'll help the ecosystem. Everything gets better by grazing. Thank you.